Hi, and welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, this we're in Acts chapter 7, and this is FSI number 27, Alpha, and that's Full Stature Initiative number 27. This is our 27th segment going through the book of Acts. This is a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the book of Acts. There are two modes to this study. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us recently, on Sundays we have our broadcast modality where I uh, speak and talk through the passages of scripture. And then on Wednesdays, we have a Zoom session where listeners get to share their insights that may have been provoked by what we covered on Sunday. So and that's more of a, ne a mesh network topology where every joint has an opportunity to help edify every other joint. And that has been hugely beneficial, in my opinion, as far as I'm concerned. Now, what we're doing here at FSI, we are not following a prescription of approved opinion like a lot of other bible studies that you find they're they're following the denominational you know the the institutional narrative of the things that you're supposed to say like if you're a baptist there's certain things you're supposed to say in acts 7 there's certain things you're supposed to say in acts 8 or if you're a pre you know there's certain things in the approved narrative or the collection of approved opinions and the approved christian celebrities and the approved uh you know, the officially endorsed and accredited commentaries and things like that. We are not just rehashing that kind of stuff and putting it out there. We are not doing that. This is exploratory in nature. This is also an attempt to look at first principles thinking when when we're encountering the text. We're not just trying to regurgitate the things that have been taught by somebody else. Now, because of that, when people come and they're new, it's a little, it can be a little scary because you're not exactly sure what you're getting. You're kind of used to hearing certain things. And then when you hear something that's a little bit different, you're like, wow, is this guy, this, this kind of sounds like maybe it's useful, but I also don't know if this guy's not a quack, okay? And that is a legitimate fear. And that's probably a fear that you should have, all right? But we are trying to be earnest here. We're trying to explore scripture. Wherever scripture leads, we want to explore it and dig it up. And then we don't necessarily feel like we have to fully emotionally commit to whatever potential conclusions that we think we find, but we want to explore and find them anyway, okay? So what we're doing here is kind of experimental. It's kind of new. We're not asking anybody who listens to necessarily believe or agree with any particular thing. We're just trying to expose perspectives so that perhaps we can gain some insight to, to better transform into the image of Christ. That's our that's our real primary goal, okay? And uh, because it's not a cookie cutter ministry like so many others, it can be kind of alarming like how much uh, how much of this can I take or should I take or how do I know when this guy is going off because I don't have the ability to compare it to brother Melms over here because he's not even delved into that category and I don't have an approved opinion to compare this thing to. All right? So I get that. I get that. But we're trying to develop our discernment, our sense making, we're delving into the four kinds of knowing and trying to see where we see that in scripture and uh, look at the transitions, all that kind of stuff. So that's what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is a little experimental, it's a little bit novel, and um, I'm constantly trying to look for ways to ramp up the, <laughs> the novelty that we're encountering. So that's what we're doing here. It's a verse by verse study through the book of Acts. And if you like what's going on, you want to keep, see it continue, we appreciate everybody who supports the channel. We cannot do this without you. It takes time, space, resources. And also, the more, the longer we do this, the more people we encounter who aren't sure what we're doing, and we get lots of mixed feedback, which also has to be dealt with. So there's a, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good thing to have these interactions with people, but it also takes time and it takes resources. So we really appreciate those who value this kind of thing, who want to keep seeing this kind of exploratory approach to scripture in earnestness. And uh, if you want to support this endeavor and help keep it ad free so that we can pay for all this stuff, um, please see the description. Uh, the, <laughs> the details are in the description below for PayPal and Venmo if you want to help support this. So we really appreciate everybody who does that. We are in Acts chapter seven. And, oh, let's see here. We left off, and I try not to do a whole lot of review on what we've done in the past because we have so many other videos. We've This is number 27, which means there are 26 other videos where we've covered a whole bunch of things before. And if you've been following, and 
I don't want it to be too daunting to you if you haven't been following from the beginning, but if you start now, hopefully you understand that some stuff has already been covered, so we're not going to do a whole bunch of review. So the, where we left off last time, Stephen is speaking to the council, and in verse 49, as he's talking to the council, he's kind of rehashing the history of the Jewish people after he had been accused of speaking blasphemous words against Moses and against the temple that sort of thing. And so he is talking about the temple. Solomon built him a house, howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. And what we left off on is when he quotes this passage, this passage where he says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. If you follow that, where he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1, if you follow that through, it details the hypocrisy of the contemporary Jews of the time of Isaiah 66, 1. And it's almost understood. Anybody who, any Jew in that audience, they all knew the Bible very well, okay? It's like somebody in our culture who's all watched the same movies that can all quote the same things and finish each other's jokes and all that stuff. And so while he's talking about the Old Testament, if he mentions one verse, they can fill in the rest of it with their minds. And it And it seems like when he quotes Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, that verses 3 and 4 are implied that that's about them, the people he's talking to. And in so many words, you have this direct direct accusation here. He says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So they're resisting the Holy Ghost. Um, this stiff-necked and uncir- this stiff-necked thing shows up in the Old Testament so many times, and you, um, I'm trying to like Deuteronomy ten sixteen. Um, he says, "Circumcise therefore." In Deuteronomy ten sixteen, let me put it over here on the right hand side. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Okay, so there's this idiom that goes throughout the the Old Testament already where, yeah, they have physical circumcision, but then they can also use that as a metaphor for just not being stubborn and being a genuine follower of God. Now, doctrinally, yes, later on, like in Colossians 2, there is a spiritual circumcision. Yes, there is. So uncircumcised in heart, but that isn't revealed yet. Paul isn't even saved yet. I don't think that this is, while technically it's true, because if they're unsaved, they don't have the spiritual circumcision. So that's true statement, but I don't think that's how Stephen means it here. When he says stiff neck and uncircumcised and heart and ears, I think it's a reference to this kind of language that we see in the Old Testament. Circumcised therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff neck. It's a metaphor for getting your heart in the right place. Don't just go through the actions on the outside, lip service, virtue signaling, but actually embody the virtue. Don't just signal the virtue. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So of all the history of the Jewish people that Stephen has just laid out, he connects the council that he's talking to. This council has all the power, okay? He connects the council back to all the people who always resisted and did the bad things. He basically just connected them to people who were following the tabernacle of Moloch, the star of their god Remphan, and the people who made the golden calf. He's connecting the, this current council to those people, saying, you guys are the rebels. You, you, There's been rebels all throughout history, and you guys are the rebels of today. And that would be kind of like, this gets overused in today's society, but it would be like saying, in, like everybody knows that Nazis were horrible and bad. Right, And when everyone looks back on history, they see themselves as the good guys. Well, this is kind of like saying, you guys are just, you are the Nazi prison guards of today. It's like saying that, okay? Now, today that gets thrown around so much, it doesn't really mean anything because everyone's just weaponizing the idea of something horrible. So today in the political landscape, when you hear about like an accusation of something horrible, like racism, sexism, bigoted, homophobe, Hitler, Nazi, all this kind of stuff, People are just throwing words around because they disagree and can't can't disagree based on the substance. But the issue is, if you could imagine that being used in a very serious way and it hitting home like, oh my, 
I am the Nazi prison guard of today. And don't take that out of context. <laughs> okay. But of all the bad guys, you, as your fathers did, so do ye. In other words, you're the bad guys in this story. This story has many turning points. And as some people have pointed out, the Jews had a psychotechnology of understanding the cosmos as a divine narrative with certain key turning points. And the, and the narrative would be like Kronos time and then the Kairos time would be the key turning points. Like when, when Moses shows up and takes him out of, a, out of the land of Egypt, that's a time of Kairos. When, when they could, and that whole segment of time where they could go into the promised land right then or they could reject it and then have to wait 40 years. In Exodus 32, after the golden calf incident, <laughs> God wanted to do away with all the Jews and Moses intervened and God was going to start over with Moses, you see, and start, start the father of many nations things from there. And Moses like, no, 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 God, please don't do that. So Moses intervened. So that was a huge time of Kairos. You know, theoretically, if Moses hadn't intervened, maybe God would have done away with all. So things could turn out very, very differently. So a time of Kairos is a time when the decisions that you make can very greatly affect the outcome of the future. So before Moses showed up, you know, you got 430 years of slavery that's just ongoing. There's not really a whole lot you can do to change that regardless of who you worship. And God is not in this place where what the people do really affects the outcome that he's going to choose for them. But then they get into this other situation they go out of the Kronos time into the Kairos time where there's a whole bunch of things up in the air. Does God keep the Jewish people and keep going with them even though they made this golden calf and start over with Moses or does he not? Does he, you know, they, he is the promised land. You can either go in or you cannot. So the decisions at this point have a huge impact. And in the time of Kairos, there's a lot more directionality to where an impact to the decisions that you make and the impact that those decisions can have. And so it's kind of it's kind of a time to be extremely cautious. And like the old Greek fable where they're sailing the boat between Scylla and Charybdis, where on one side you have this whirlpool that can suck you in, on this other side you have this six-headed dragon that can eat all your men, and you have to try to, you know, sail the fine line right between them so you don't die from either one of them. And if you make one wrong, any, any wrong decision and something's going to get you, everything is going to go south. And Jesus Christ of Nazareth showing up is one of these times of Kairos. You have this Kronos time ever since, you know, Babylon was a time of Kairos. And you come out of Babylon, it's been kind of even keel so far under the Romans for so many years. Then all of a sudden the Messiah shows up. Now, what do you do with the Messiah? That matters, and it's this time of Kairos again, where what you, as a nation, decide to do with the Messiah makes a huge deal. You can be on one side of history, you know how some people say, you're on the wrong side of history, or we're on the right side of history. So you could be on one side of history where you receive the Messiah, or you could be on the wrong side of history where you reject the Messiah. And both of them have costs, and both of them have risks, and both of them have unknowns. And not only should you receive the Messiah, but Israel as a nation had to receive the Messiah. And the big risk was this. If we receive Jesus as the Messiah, that means he's the king, as in King David and King Solomon, which means we are openly rebelling against Roman rule and against Herod being our little puppet king. All that goes out the window. Jesus is the king. If we receive him as the Messiah, it's time to overthrow the illegitimate leaders. If we're wrong, we're going to get stomped. <laughs> okay? If we're wrong, we're going to get stomped. So that's a big problem. Big problem. So it is, um, when it comes down to decision making, it is troubling. It'd be troubling to be in that situation and, you know, how do you know you're doing the right thing? Now, later on, now, first of all, there have been a lot, if you read Acts 5, which we already covered, there have already been people coming up claiming to be the Messiah, and they wind up washing out. And so there's a legitimate concern, like, okay, there's this Jesus of Nazareth guy, 
How do we know he's legit? There's been other guys claiming to be the Messiah. There's not, they're not legit. There's been other zealots trying to lead <clears throat> you know, military revolts against Rome, and they washed out. Um, how, you know, how do you decide correctly on who to follow? Okay, So that's why Jesus shows up with all these signs to prove who he is. And when he heals somebody, he says, go tell the priest. He doesn't just say, he doesn't just heal them and go tell everybody. He's not trying to start a grassroots revolt. It has to be a genuine turning officially. Israel has to officially accept the Messiah. You know, some people try to paint Jesus as this rebel walking around, like going against the flow. No, Jesus is trying to restore the legitimacy because in order for things to progress eschatologically, Israel officially has to receive the Messiah, officially. Now, a little later on, you know, there's not a huge divide at this point. And we see throughout the book of Acts, there's not a huge divide between Jews and Gentiles. And Jews and Gentiles believe and keep being um, the, the Jewish believers who believe Jesus is the Messiah. They keep going to temple and synagogue along with the Jewish believers who did, Jewish people who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. So they're still going to the same temple. They're still going to the same synagogue. There's not really a huge division among them, okay? Now, I'm going to say something historically, and this could be interpreted a lot of different ways, but it's interesting to note. Later on, 132 AD, we're talking about 100 years after this, okay? There's this guy who rises up, and it is possible maybe this guy can overthrow the Romans, Simon Bar Kokhba, okay? So Simon Bar Kokhba, is, it's called the Bar Kokhba Revolt. And in 132 AD time frame, he's leading this revolt. And the army of the Jews is composed of both uh, believers in Jesus as the Messiah, Jews, and people who don't think Jesus is the Messiah, Jews. All Jews, some think Jesus is the Messiah, some don't. Well, right before a big battle, one of the rallying cries, the high priest Akiva stood up and instead of it just being a military battle with Simon Bar Kokhba being the general to lead them into victory, which w was arguably likely at that point, he stood up and said, Simon Bar Kokhba is the Messiah and we should follow him. Well, at that point, about half of the army, give or take, did not, they believed Jesus was the Messiah. So like, um, excuse me, we can't fight under that banner. So they defected. And they left, and then the just, you know, the other part of the army that didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah was left to go fight the Romans. And then bad things happened. It did not go well. <laughs> it went horribly. And some historians say that that is the turning point where, like, Jews and believers in Jesus as Messiah really started, really started becoming a lot of animosity there. Because before that, you know, Jews have all these reasons and post hoc rationalizations for why Jesus of Nazareth is not the Messiah, right? Well, historically, the idea is that those things weren't all developed. It was like this thing that other people were kind of agnostic about it. I'm not following Jesus as Messiah. Maybe he was a Messiah. Maybe he wasn't. No big deal. So they're just kind of agnostic about it, and they don't have a problem with other people following Jesus as a Messiah. Okay, that's your, that's fine. You know, there's all these other sects out here, the Essenes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. You can be a Jesus of Nazareth follower, follower of the way, and we got all these other groups anyway, no big deal, right? Well, when that happened, some historians say that's when the big split happened where there was a lot, there now became a lot of animosity from the Jews against the Christians, against the believers in Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, because of that. So there was another time of Kairos historically where somebody said the wrong thing. <laughs> Akiva stood up and said the wrong thing. It did it was supposed to be this rallying cry that was supposed to make everybody take up arms and and go steadfastly into the battle with the assurance of victory and it had the opposite effect. So what happens in a time of Kairos really matters. This is the time of Kairos. Jesus of Nazareth has showed up. He is the Messiah. And these guys who happen to be in the seat of power in the council, instead of following the Messiah, they had him crucified. So that's uh, not good. Verse 52. He said, which of the fathers have you, which of the prophets have your fathers have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and the murderers. 
whoever so that that's real similar to what Jesus says in Matthew 23 31 to 33 wherefore ye be witnesses to yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets fill ye up then the measure of your fathers ye serpents ye generation of vipers how can ye escape the damnation of hell cuz Jesus was such a sweet loving person he only said nice things to people okay you have to understand that oh it's always funny to me when I'm talking with a Calvinist. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to shoot straight with him and tell him how it is. Something like, there's no gospel in Calvinism. And then and I explain why. And they, tr- and then they try to take the victim route. Oh, now you're just being mean and harsh. Don't you know? You should be more Christ-like than the way you deal with people. Have you seen how Christ deals with people? Do you really want me to be more? No, I don't think you do. I don't think you do. So Stephen goes on who have received the law by disposition of angels and have not kept it. Now, Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse 28, when somebody, and this is a good verse to remember for Catholics, because in, 11, in, in Luke eleven twenty seven, and it came to pass as he spake these things, a certain, women, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. In other words, blessed is, the, blessed is your mother. You're, you're just a great, wonderful person. Blessed is your mother. And you know what Jesus' answer is? Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. (laughs) That's the deal right there. That's who's blessed. So he's such a straight right there. Um, You got your first Mary worshiper shows up, and Jesus corrects the first Mary worshiper. And it's it's not about worshiping Mary or or blessing Mary or anything else. Not that there's anything wrong with Mary, but you don't want to take things out of proportion. Um, Jesus said, blessed are they that hear, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. In other words, that is preferred over honoring Jesus's mother. Now, some people take that the wrong way. I'm not saying that Jesus's mother does not have a place of honor. I'm just saying that this is preferred. Yea, rather value one thing over the next thing. And then there's all kinds of passages about receiving the law by disposition of angels that we could look at, which if you wanted to follow up with Galatians 3.19, Deuteronomy 33.2, Hebrews 2.2, 2, and then also in verse 38 of this chapter here, um, that talks more about that. Now, when they heard these things, verse 54, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. And it reminds me of the words that Jesus said that there should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> now, that's very interesting. I can just imagine, you ever thought a sermon went bad? Did it ever wind up with the audience attacking you and gnashing on you with their teeth? Now, he's, they're gnashing on him with their teeth. They're biting him. <laughs> they're biting him. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, and that's what we see in chapter 6, verse 5, we see that Stephen is full of the Holy Ghost. Um, Right here in Acts 6, verse 5, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost. And Philip and Prochorus, that kind of thing. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God standing on the right hand of God. Now, the first question that would pop in my mind, if it wasn't for the next verse, would be like, how would Luke know that? Because Luke is writing this. But then he says, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So they're biting him with their teeth. Stephen's looking up steadfastly into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now, I can imagine, I mean, being bitten by a bunch of people probably hurts, but I would imagine that seeing something like that might cause the pain to subside, might have your adrenaline going, and sometimes when your adrenaline is going to a sufficient degree, it is also a a pain reducer, okay? And then there's also other things that could be going on, like when sometimes when people know that their death is pending, they kind of dissociate a little bit to the point where... They don't feel anything that happens. Like some mammals, when they're in the in the grips of a prey, a predator, they just go limp and paralyzed out of fear, but also they don't feel anything while that happens, according to some people. I don't know. but So we don't know what's happening here. So there's probably a mixture of adrenaline, fear, everything else. So I would say that this seeing this would be a gift for Stephen to have something to distract you from being bitten in all this 
Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And up here, Luke reports it as he's full of the Holy Ghost. He looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. Now, steadfastly into heaven makes it sound like maybe there was something like he's being bitten. He's going to be stoned later. And no matter what they're doing to manipulate his body and turn him and bite him or whatever and tackle him, whatever else they're doing, he's, it's like he can't look away from something. It's something's got his attention and he can't look away. Like, wow, look at that. So now he says this strange thing. He saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Behold, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now that is odd. That is odd that he is standing. Because <laughs> we have all these passages, starting with Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And I heard somebody say recently, and I don't know if this is true, but Psalm 110, I think when you, cause it's, it talks about Melchizedek. It talks about this here. Somebody said that Psalm 110 is the most quoted from chapter in the new Testament. Now, I haven't verified that, but it's a very interesting conjecture or a very interesting proposition that, that might be true. And if it's true, it, it's very interesting. Even if it's not true, it is quoted a whole lot, which still makes it interesting. So he said, sit thou on my right hand till I make thy knees my footstool. And you, this is repeated over and over and over again, but here you see him standing. Right? Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about this because, and I'll, I'll show you why. Let me bring up our, our handy dandy PowerPoint slideshow over here. In... In FSI number 12, we did a video called Why is Jesus Standing? Okay, And this connects Acts 3, 19 through 21 to the verses that we're studying today where Stephen looks up and sees Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So if you have not seen that video, I highly encourage you to go back and watch that video. But the issue is this. If Jesus is standing on the right hand of the throne of God and every passage that we see has him seated at the right hand of the throne of God until, until a certain thing, until his enemies become his footstool, it looks like a time of Kairos right here where Stephen is presenting the Messiah to the council. In order for the Messiah to be, for all the eschatological events to kick in, Israel has to officially receive her Messiah. So there's this decision point here. There's, you know, choose your own adventure. You're going to go this way, you're going to go that way. If the, if the council receives Jesus as Messiah, maybe it's time for Jesus to come back, to stand up and come back and make his uh, enemies his footstool. But he's supposed to be sitting, supposed to be sitting at the right hand of God, but he's not sitting, he's standing. My opinion, and I'm telling you that it's my opinion, I'm not telling you, you this is doctrine or that you have to believe it. My opinion is that this is a period, this is a point of transition here, just like going into the promised land. And the point of transition has basically three phases to it. Messiah was presented in person. Let me show you this, this chartication over here. Let me orient you to my little handy dandy chart. <clears throat> So if you look at, okay, here's where Jesus Christ is crucified. And these little golden M's here represent the times when Jesus Christ is presented as Messiah to the council, where they have a chance to officially receive him. And then you see that in Acts chapter 4 and 5, Jesus is presented to the council again. And here we are in Acts chapter 7, where Jesus is presented to the council again. The council has to receive Jesus Christ in order for the eschatological events to kick in. And so these, these three points right here, here, and here are key points of Kairos where the council could receive the Messiah. And if they receive the Messiah, certain things start happening if they don't. So this would be why this, to me, I, my understanding of this is that this, this is like third strike and you're out. Since the Messiah is being presented to the council right here, this is their chance to receive the Messiah and kick off es eschatological events to where you could have all this could have started happening right over here instead of being pushed off into the future, you know, 2,000 years after that or not, you know, more or less, 2,000 years more or less after that. 
We're gonna look at that chart a little bit more in a few minutes. Well, we might as well go ahead and do it now. But notice, uh, well, let's let's delay. Let's let's look at it in a few minutes. But I think this is a period of transition. This is a period of Kairos, and they're making the wrong decision by not receiving Jesus Christ as the Messiah. But he is standing, indicating that hey, we either you're either gonna receive Messiah or hey, we're gonna change, we're gonna shift the church age over to where it's going to become Gentile-centric. Gentile-centric. So it's a turning point. Now, we'll talk about the Gentile thing in a few minutes, provided that we have time, and I think we do. And he said, Behold, verse 56, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Not sitting, but standing. So there's got to be a reason that he's standing. So go back and watch Number 12, FSI number 12a for why is Jesus standing for more scripture passages and reasoning on that and what the impact of that is. Then they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. I think I talked about that last week where it's one accord. That proves they're all in unity, proving they're all doing the right thing, right? Today, people talk as if unity is the big thing. If you strive for unity and if you achieve unity, that's the ultimate goal. And that's not the ultimate goal. You can be in unity and you can be wrong. And like Bob Jones Sr. used to say, the devil wants to get you all together so he can swallow you all in one gulp, all right? So unity is not always good. It's not bad, but it is a byproduct of what is good. It is not to be the main goal because it can, you can get unity at the expense of other things, which are more valuable than unity, like at the expense of truth. And then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. So, and the witnesses laid down their clothes. Now these witnesses, somebody pointed this out to me, which I appreciate that in one of our sessions. When it comes down to somebody being accused so that they get stoned and die, uh, even that man or that woman, and thou shalt stone them with stones till they die. Now it says that the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. And the hands of the witnesses shall be the first upon him to put him to death. And afterward, the hands of all the people. So thou shalt put the evil away from among you. So that's probably what's going on here where the witnesses who did, you know, they suborned evil men who brought these accusations against Stephen. Those guys are probably the first ones to start the stoning and then everybody else chimes in with them. Now these guys are laying down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name is Saul. Uh, That's interesting for a couple of reasons. Why are they laying down their clothes at a young man's feet? Why are they laying down their clothes? What they're doing is illegal. We've talked about this multiple times on this channel. One of the reasons the Jews had to turn Jesus over to Rome to be crucified is because Rome is in control. They're occupying and they tell, they tell Israel, you're allowed to follow certain rules. You're allowed to do your own thing, follow your own laws up to a certain threshold. You're not allowed to do capital punishment. You can't kill people. All right. Even if your law calls for it, you can't kill people. If your law says somebody has to die, you need to bring that, escalate that to us, and we will decide if they need to die. So that's how that works. Okay. And then, um, and this also explains what's happening at the woman at the well, not the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery. <laughs> yeah, don't confuse those. <laughs> the woman caught in adultery in John chapter eight, which by the way should be in your Bible, because um, some people say that that passage should not be in there, but it should be. And yeah, the research has been done, and I am well aware that all the new versions have little notes in the margin that say that it shouldn't be there, but it should be. So when Jesus goes to the woman taken in adultery, here's the deal. The law says stone the adulterer. The Romans say you're not allowed to stone people. So when they present Jesus with this woman caught in adultery, it's like this double whammy. Either way, he's going down in their mind, you know, they, they caught him with a what do you call that? Double jeopardy or whatever. No matter what, it's like a catch-22 situation. If you decide to stone her, now you're breaking Roman law. Then they can turn them over to the Romans for breaking their law because they're not allowed to kill people. If you decide not to stone her, well, now you're dishonoring God because you're elevating the Roman law above the Jewish law. 
And so it's like this little, they're trying to put him in this tight spot to see what he's going to do. Which, are you going to follow the Romans or the Jewish law? Because either way, you can get him ostracized as a false teacher who exalts man's authority over God's authority, or you can turn him over to the Romans for breaking their law. Either way, they think they got him. And that's why it's um, so clever and wise where Jesus is like, okay, he that is without sin cast the first stone. And then nobody does. So it's kind of a gamble. And I would, I would hate to be the woman where, <laughs> where the gamble was, where I was the collateral for the gamble. It's either going to be her or not. Uh, and then they all wind up not throwing any stones. And he says, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. The point is, in, they're in the same dilemma now. If they get caught doing capital punishment, they can they can be turned over to the Romans for breaking the law for committing murder. They don't want that to happen. Now that your clothes identified you for a variety of reasons, people had fringes on their garments and things, and there's some interesting cultural stuff behind that that ties into Ruth and all that, but basically they had fringes on their garments, kind of like a family crest, which would... You could look at somebody's robes from a pretty good distance and tell who they were or at least what family they were part of. You know, especially if they were part of the council, all their stuff was really fancy. So everybody knew who these guys were. So they laid down their robes. And my understanding of why you would do that is for plausible deniability. So it, it, like everybody's probably got undergarments that are just like a plain white robe with no fancy robes over it. So they're probably taking off their fancy robes, laying them down so you can't tell who they are. Just a bunch of dudes in white robes, you know. <laughs> so they lay, down their, they lay down their robes and they start stoning him so they can have, uh, a, what do you call it, identification or something like that? Anyway, anonymity. Anonymity while they commit murder. So yeah, this guy was murdered, but um, <laughs> we don't know who did it. They lay down his, their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So they're not calling. The sentence structure is weird because when you're, um, when you're doing this, uh, t some translators might stick in the word who. They stoned Stephen who was calling upon God and saying. But the sentence structure here is they stoned Stephen calling upon God. It makes it sound like they were calling upon God. But no, Stephen is the one calling upon God. That's a phrase modifying Stephen, not the they, not the subject of the verb. And saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he kneels down and says, Lord, lay not this into their charge. When he says, some people criticize Stephen because Jesus did this in reverse order. He thought of the other people first. Father, forgive them for they know not that what they do. And then, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Well, that's the order Jesus did it in. And Stephen says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit first. So some people criticize him for being selfish here, for thinking of himself first. I think that's, I just think that's ridiculous. That's, that's just ridiculous to criticize how he would behave during this time and call him selfish for, for getting these two things out of order. Uh, some people's kids. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice saying, lay not this sin to their charge. Now, when you hear Father forgive them for they know not what they do, and lay not this into their charge. It's it's tempting to think that it's just about simple forgiveness. Like, God, forgive them. But look, let's go back to our little chart over here. Okay? On our chart, one of these times, one of these times that they reject the Messiah is going to be the last time. All right? It could have been this time. It could have been this time, but one of these times that they reject their Messiah is going to be the final time. And I think what Stephen is saying here is like, don't let this be them exhausting all their chances to do what's right. Don't, give them another chance. If you're, if you're a Jew, you're an Israelite, there's some patriotism there. You, you love your land. You love the people. You love the culture. And you don't want to see them sign their own domicidal warrant, okay? So you're, just like I'm in the USA here, we don't want to see any ba anything bad happen to this country. Like, don't let this mistake be our ruin as a nation, in other words. 
And that's, I kind of think that's where Stephen is with this. Like, I want Israel to actually receive her Messiah and go on to do the right thing. So don't let this be the final straw, Lord. Lay not this sin to their charge, but let's, you know, let's give them one more shot. (laughs) That kind of thing is what I see in my mind. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Well, you say falling asleep isn't that bad, right? Well, he didn't just fall asleep. Because the very next verse tells you what that means. And when he said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was consenting unto his sleep. No, death. Saul was consenting unto his death. So he's dead. He's gone. Now Saul is persecuting. Now look at what happens here. And at that time... There was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. This is something that definitely needs to be unpacked. Saul was consenting unto his death. At that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And there we go. Okay, that's the verse I was looking for. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, pause right there. I want you to think about something. When you think about the structure of the book of Acts and Luke, who's writing it, and the things that he decides to make salient, do you remember what Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says? It says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Okay? Can be witnesses of me. Where? Where? Jerusalem. What where have they been this whole time? This whole time, and you may not realize this reading through, but this whole time the book of Acts has been taking place in Jerusalem. And now for the first time, people are starting to get scattered abroad. To where they're this the the narrative is moving outside Jerusalem now. Now they're scattered abroad, going to the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Well, now look at Acts chapter one verse eight. There's Jerusalem, and then there's Judea, and there's Samaria. Well, what's the what's the other part that hasn't happened yet? Well, that's the uttermost part of the earth. Now notice it doesn't say who the audience is. It says the place. People tend to look at Acts chapter 1 verse 8 as the Great Commission. Like in the, in the Gospel of Mark, preach the gospel to every creature. In Matthew, you know, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. The, there's a reference to the audience there in, in Matthew and Mark. And when you look at Acts chapter 8 verse 1, it sounds like the Great Commission, but it's only, it only references places. Only references places. It does not reference the audience. It doesn't say who to preach to or who to be witnesses to. It just tells you where to be a witness. That's important. Why is that important? If you keep going in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, look at verse 4. This doesn't want to cooperate with me now. I think my computer's thinking too hard about something right now. Therefore, when they were scattered abroad, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. It doesn't say they went preaching the word to everyone. It says they went everywhere preaching the word. Well, who were they preaching to? You might think because, you know, Jesus came and Jesus is for everybody and everybody can get saved. Yeah, that's how it is now, but it's not that way yet, at least not in the understanding of the people. They go everywhere preaching the word. Who are they preaching to? Let's look at Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 11 verse 18, is they're celebrating Cornelius having just gotten saved. And so far, they're only preaching to Jews. They don't even know Gentiles can get saved until Cornelius does. And it says, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance to life. So you would cross-reference that with Acts chapter 5, verse 31, and granting repentance to Israel, 
which is already granted, and now it's granted to Gentiles. Now, Calvinists try to use this as a proof text to say that God has to grant repentance to people before they can, like, individually, okay? But this is being granted to Gentiles. In other words, the point is you don't have to follow the law and be circumcised to keep to be saved. How do I know that? Because that's what all of chapter 15 is about, okay? It's about people who are Gentiles not having to become Jews in order to be saved, being granted repentance like like a blessing, like a decree, like a like a law kind of thing. It's not an indiv- individualistic, punctic- punctiliar thing like Calvinists try to make it out to be. Um, repentance has been granted. If you're a Gentile, repentance is granted to you. God hath also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Are you a Gentile? Repentance is granted unto you, Acts eleven eighteen. Are you a Jew? Repentance is granted to you, Acts five thirty one. There, God just granted you repentance. Take advantage of it. Now they which were now we're looking here, verse four. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. We well, you know they went everywhere preaching the word, but who were they preaching to? Okay, or to whom were they preaching? Because we don't want to end sentences, even questions, in a preposition. It's okay to end it in a proposition, but not a preposition. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but to Jews only. So that's the only people they're preaching. They're going everywhere, more or less, but they're not preaching to everyone. That's what you got to understand. So when you look at Acts 4 verse Acts 8 verse 4 over here on the left, it looks like they're going everywhere preaching the word to everyone. No, no, no. They're not preaching to everyone. They're preaching to Jews. How do you know that? says it right there in Acts 11, 19. After the persecution of Stephen, they go all these places preaching the word to none but to Jews only. So the idea that you can preach to Gentiles has not saturated their cabeza yet, okay? That's something they still got to work on. And they're following this old stuff that Jesus gave. They're following the fax machine. There's inertia. There's guidance inertia, if you will. Jesus tells the 12 in Matthew chapter 5 verse 6, he sent them forth saying, go not in the way of the Gentiles or to any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that stuck. It's got inertia with it. So yeah, it makes sense to us that the program should have been updated. Didn't they hear the Great Commission in Mark and in Matthew? Yeah, but there's inertia. There's program inertia. The idea that you can just go to the Gentiles and they can get saved without having to be, you know, Jewish proselytes, that that's crazy. We had no idea. And not only that, but like, even if you thought, how does conversion take place? Put yourself perspectively, use perspectival knowing, and put yourself in the mind of a first century Jew. How do people start to follow God as far as you're concerned? They, f- they become Jews. They become Jewish proselytes, okay? That is how people convert. The idea that somebody can just believe in Jesus as the Messiah, and then they're one of God's people, not a thought in their head. They're not for it. They're not against it. Just hasn't entered their head. It's not a thing. Not a thing. So even if you hear the Great Commission, how are you doing? How are you getting converts now? You're proselytizing them to Judaism. How are you going to get converts after the Great Commission? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Kind of sounds like you're still proselytizing them to Judaism, only now with the understanding that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay. So we tend to read our own perspective because we are perhaps, you know, perspectively possessed, you know, or point of view. We have point of view possession. We, you know, it's, we're kind of narcissistic in the way we look at things. We can only see our own point of view. Today, you hear the gospel, you believe, you're saved, end of story. You get baptized the same day and you're one of the brethren. No big deal. Nobody was thinking that way back then. That's not the way they were thinking. And it wasn't challenged, so there was nothing to undo the thinking. And, you know, some people would take the way they do now, and they, they go back in time and say, well, you have to prove that they didn't mean, you have to prove that they didn't mean that. No, 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 no. 
You need to put yourself in how they're thinking at that time. And when they hear these things, what are they hearing and how are they understanding it in the environment and the contextual and cultural environment in which they are? In the cultural con- context in which they are. So they were told to just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So in Acts chapter 8 verse 4, when they're scattered abroad, they're still following that guidance back from Jesus all the way back then. And Jesus even says later on, he, he ministers to Gentiles by exception, but not programmatically. And programmatically is my little way of understanding it. Even when this, this Canaanite woman, this woman of Canaan, in Acts chapter 15, verse 22, came out of the coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy, O Lord, on me, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. And he answered her, Not a word. That's kind and compassionate of him, isn't it? I think that's just loving, it's just loving of the Savior to do that. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He just turns this woman away. Now we know the story. She came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She was persistent. And then he said, It's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. <laughs> that's... That sounds so harsh. And then later on, she comes again. Jesus answered and said, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Okay. But programmatically, so he's ministering to to Gentiles by exception, turning them away on take number one, take number two, in in this case. And then saying he's not sent but to lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that is, this is one of the perspectival things where in our perspective today, we think a lost person going about their lost life in the United States, doing what people do, they can come to church or they can hear the gospel and they can receive Jesus Christ and they can be saved from that moment forward. It's not a, tr- it's not a stretch for us. We got it, as far as we're concerned, happens all the time. Go back in time, that's not how they saw things. Not how they saw things. Even when they're hearing the Great Commission from Jesus Christ, they're still thinking proselyte to Judaism in order to get to Judaism's Messiah. That's that's how they're thinking. That's their thinking. So the idea that they're just preaching to Jews. They're preaching everywhere, but not to everyone. All right? And how do you know that? That's what the text says. Acts eleven nineteen. Now that's that's one of those. It's one of those things you're just, you're not going to hear in Southern Baptist Sunday School literature. Okay, and that's what, like I got this book over here. Where's this book? I got this book called Shocked by the Bible, and it points out some things. And some things are common things, like we know that there were three gifts, but that doesn't mean there were just three wise men and stuff like that. There's a bunch of those things in there. And there's if you just read the Bible, you find out there's we read our current understanding back into the Bible all the time and don't even know we're doing it. All right. We got to cut that out. We have to pay close attention to the text and use perspectival. Zoom out in history. Understand what are the thresholds of knowledge? When did they come to know things? When did they not know things? And what did they know at this point? And what were they thinking? What was their mindset? And try to put yourself in their mindset at that time and realize what a significant, crazy, wild transition this was that now we can just preach the gospel directly to Gentiles and they don't have to convert to Judaism first. Big mind blower for them. Huge, huge mind blow for them. And they're not there yet. They're not there yet. They don't understand this yet. So as far as they're concerned, as far as they're concerned, everybody who's following Jesus as Messiah is Jewish either by birth or by conversion. There are no just straight up Gentiles getting saved. And nobody's even thinking that way. They're just, just going about preaching to Jews. So at that time, Stephen was consen- Saul was consenting unto his death, Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, here's one of the, I want to try to read into the background a little bit, okay? Let me, let me, I'll, let's do the background thing in verse three. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. 
Now, Saul making havoc of the church. We'll look at a couple verses real quick. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if, any, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Okay? So he's not necessarily going out in the letters. The letters that he's getting from the priests don't sound like they're authorizing him to do any killing. But it, if you look at what he describes later on, it kind of sounds like maybe there's some killing going on in Acts 9.13. Ananias answered the Lord, and he said, I have heard this man, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. So the reputation of Saul is going around in Acts 9.21, but all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? So he's causing havoc to the church. In Acts 22.4, he says, I persecuted this way. Now, the word Christian doesn't show up until Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And it was used probably as an epithet, not necessarily as a pejorative, but they didn't show up calling themselves Christians. It was a way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when, when Jesus had going on was, there was a way. And I've heard other people call it like the agopic way or other, the way of Love and love is a weak word in the English because we use it for so many different things. Anything from the kind of chocolate that you prefer to your kids to your spouse to uh, the feeling you get at a football game. We we say love for all kinds of different things. But the agape is this is this self sacrificial giving toward the well being of another person, even if you never see any return on your investment. Okay. So I persecuted this way. It's, under, it's important to understand that. Now, the way. You know what? Ugh. The In the East, they have something called the Tao. And you know what that, that means? The way. And that's it's very interesting to me that there's that parallel there. What does it mean? We're not going to get into that here. And it might mean nothing. But the, it's interesting that there's this there's this concept of I want to look at this word now. <laughs> there's this concept of something that it's not static and it's not stagnant. It's something moving about it. There's there, there's something that has to do with motion. There's something that has to do with forward motion and aspiration and change. Um, there's that aspect to following Jesus. Propositional Christianity, and what is that? That we think that in the Western church, we think that we can create all this, like all our statements of faith and all our institutions, and we have all these seminaries, you know, disseminating and like scaled propositional truth claims. And we think that we can finitely capture everything that we need to know about God in order to be effective for him in the ministry, right? There's a finitude to it. There's a finality to it. There's a certainty to it. There's a there's like a container aspect to it. And we've got this container of our of our statements of faith, and this collects all the things that if we pass down these conclusions to other people, then that's following God. No, that's stagnant. That is stale. That is not moving, it's stationary, it's in one place. The way is, there's some. There's something moving to it, there's something procedural to it, there's something perspectival or something participatory about it. It's not just a bunch of propositional truth claims about things that you're supposed to willfully affirm that they're true. That's not following Jesus. And you could say that that's probably constitutes following a false Jesus. But the way, there's something about the way. Now, I think I don't agree with the Methodists, either in their founding or their what's going on now, but I think they're on to something like a grain of truth is that there is some method to following the way. There's some kind of method to it. As far as that's concerned, I think there's a grain of truth. I think they're on to something. It needs to be developed further and get some of the other errors they had in there out of there. 
but the the main concept of it including a way, a methodology, a process to it, I think they're on to something. Anyway, uh, Paul is giving us testimony in Acts 22, and he says, I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And in Acts 26, 9 through 11, Verily, verily, I thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. So how were they put to death? Was it like Stephen, or were they handing them over to Rome? Or did they have some kind of agreement with Rome that like, look, let's understand this. These people who are following the way, this Jesus of Nazareth thing, it's causing trouble for us, Jews, and it's going to cause trouble for you, Rome. Now look, Rome, I'm just speaking as a one of the non-Messianic Jewish council members talking to Rome, you know. We appreciate everything you do. We want to stay in a good relationship with you. These guys could cause serious problems for us. So I know we're not supposed to kill people, but it would be very helpful if you would allow us to like give us the authority to squash this movement because it could bring us both down and we don't want that to happen. We want to stay happily submitted to you just like we are under our current arrangement. We don't want this to become a problem. We disavow ourselves of this uprising. I don't want you to confuse it with us. It's not us doing it. It's these other crazies and we just want your authority to put them to death. Now I'm reading between the lines here that maybe there was some kind of like under the table agreement, something like that going on. The text doesn't say it, but it would not it would not surprise me if something like that was going on. He said, I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, admit so he's got authority and commission to do this kind of thing. Other passages. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. For I am of the least of the apostles, and I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. He says, For ye have heard my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6. Go to it. Work link. He's talking about his own past concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he's persecuting the church there. And this other passage, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, talking about his previous life before he was saved, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He obtained mercy not because it was unconditional before the foundation of the world, but because... He did something wrong, ignorantly and in unbelief, which apparently had a difference, made a difference. But the point is, he's making havoc of the church. Now, look what he's doing. He's entering into every house and hailing men and women and committing them to prison, to drawing them out and taking them to prison. So they're, he's it, on the road to Damascus. It seems like Paul has an entourage with him. So he's got some kind of probably an enforcement team with him who's... They're going from house to house, entering into every house. So they're probably doing house raids, kicking in doors, going in, finding people. I heard there were Christians in here. And they're going in with swords and everything, and they're taking they're taking people out. And it you could imagine that it would be something like a witch hunt where uh, the there's informants running around like like uh, like in communist Russia in the Bolshevik Revolution. There's informants running around, you know, if you ever read nineteen eighty four. There's People inform me, oh, I think they're a Christian. I think they're a Christian. And everybody's scared to death to be hauled off and taken to jail because nobody, if you get called out to be a Christian, they're going to come get you. And so there's, um, I think Andrew Clavin did a show recently where it was titled Moral Panic. And the Moral Panic is something like the Salem Witch Trials where, or McCarthyism, something where there's this evil thing in society and everybody is suspected of it and nobody wants to be that thing. And one sure way to get somebody killed or in our culture canceled is to accuse them of being that thing. Like right now, you don't want to say anything racist or be perceived as anything racist, sexist, bigoted, homophobic, or anything like that, transphobic, any of that stuff will get you canceled, okay? 
And so this big fear people have who have a public life of any kind, like in Hollywood or whatever, they're afraid they're afraid of being perceived or somebody being able to blame them for any of those things because they can lose all their status, their job, their potential for career advancement. They could lose all that stuff just by being accused, okay? And uh, that situation where that exists, like a witch hunt situation where <laughs> you have, kang- like right now we have the court of public opinion. And with social media and everything else, you can be limbically hijacked to think a certain way with framing and everything else, regardless of what the facts are. So you don't even have to erect, like in the witch trials, you, you had to erect a kangaroo court to put people on trial and have a crooked court to do it. Or like they had back here with Jesus getting him crucified. You have a little kangaroo court. Um, But in the court of public opinion, you don't even have to have a kangaroo court. You just have to persuade enough people to hate the person. And then that person loses their capacity to have any kind of impact or career or anything like that. Moral panic issue. Moral panic. So that's interesting to look into that concept. And... um, it could happen at different levels, different reasons, different times. Um, so, all right. Some key things happen next. It's all Jews being saved. We're going to wrap this up. So far, it's all Jews being saved. No Gentiles being saved. They go everywhere preaching the word, but they do not go everywhere preaching to everyone. The audience is still only Jews. We know that from Acts chapter 11, verse 19. That's key. Well, there's no Gentiles getting saved yet after this. The stoning of Stephen seems to be a threshold that was crossed, after which point God starts to hand, God starts to shift over to the Gentiles. Now, notice so far there is no apostle to the Gentiles. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's not saved yet. He's still killing Christians. And by the way, he is hearing the gospel from Stephen and not repenting and being regenerated. Uh, which would suggest that the whole Calvinist theory of the sheep hear my voice out of John 10 is not the correct way to understand that passage, okay? There he was. He He's supposedly a sheep, and he hears the voice, doesn't respond to it. And he probably heard it a whole bunch of other times too. Doesn't respond to it. Keeps doing. He's been doing this for a while. Here's the gospel a whole bunch of times. Whatever happened to my sheep hear my voice? Well, they weren't ready yet. Where's your verse for that? Huh? Where's your verse for that, Calvinist? Anyway. So there's a huge transition point here. After this happens, the apostle to the Gentiles gets saved. I'll show you a little handy-dandy chart over here. We'll do this handy-dandy chart over here. On a handy-dandy chart, after they stone Stephen, they reject the Messiah. The council officially rejects the Messiah for the last time here before this transition happens. You notice I have a little cut in the timeline right here. And then it starts going from Jews only to to Jews and Gentiles together, okay? What happens next? The apostle to the Gentiles gets converted, Paul. What that means is that there is no apostle to the Gentiles before that. Acts 1-5, the baptism of the Holy Spirit does not get understood until Acts chapter 11, verse 15 through 16. And what should be in here, which is not in here, is Cornelius, your first Gentile. Peter learns that he can evangelize Gentiles right here in Acts chapter 10, okay? And then we get salvation by grace through faith gets ironed out so that everybody understands it. You don't have to be circumcised or keep the law in Acts chapter 15. And in Acts chapter 18 or 13, 18 and 28, we have this, if you Jews won't follow the, if you Jews don't want to follow the Messiah, fine. We're just going to turn to the Gentiles. See ya. We're out. We're going to the Gentiles. So there's this. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles thing that gets repeated in Acts 13, 46, and Acts 18, 6, and Acts 28, 28. This incident with Stephen seems to be a huge issue that it's not a small matter. It's not just another incident in the book of Acts that happens. It is a turning point where things start to shift um, hugely. To where it's no longer just exclusively Jews anymore. Now we're brand, now we're gonna it's gonna change into everywhere and everyone instead of just to Jews only. And that decision to make that shift, the time of Kairos, seems to be right there when Stephen was presenting to the council. 
They could go one way or they could go the other and they chose to reject the Messiah and then the church age took a new turn after that. All right, we'll talk more about that next time. We'll pick up on what that transition is and we're gonna end this video here. So let me get rid of this little visual aid and just say, uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. On Wednesday night, we're gonna have our Zoom session to discuss what we talked about today. I hope to see you then. I'll be sending out invites and emails between now and then. Thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day. Thank you.